Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this webcast on Raising Global Citizens. I'm Tony Jackson, Vice President for Education and Director for the Center for Global Education at Asia Society. And this website is webcast is one of a series of webcasts called Teaching Truth to Power. Now, within Asia Society's mission to create uh, bridges of understanding between people of Asia, the United States, and the world, we are relentlessly committed to equity. And specifically for nearly two decades, the Center for Global Education has advanced education for e global competence as an approach to both globalizing teaching from across the curriculum and through that developing in young people a mindset that abhors and actively works against racism and inequality. We developed our approach to education for global competence by asking experts in education and other fields around the world, how's the world changed and how does, how does education need to change to really enable young people to be successful in this new global environment? But we also ask ourselves as, as parents, what kinds of people do we want our kids to become? And how do we want our children to relate to others in the world, especially as our country and our neighborhoods become more diverse? We said that we want our kids to understand the world and how it works. So our approach to education for global competence supports students to learn and apply critical reasoning and, and curiosity and problem solving skills to understand the world in its full complexity. To see how local roots of issues like racism are sown by broader global forces. We want, us, uh, want our kids to see themselves as equally worthy and deserving of respect. So we designed education for global competence to ensure that Children receive experiences designed to develop empathy and to counter this sort of innate psychological mechanism of othering that is at the heart of prejudice. And we said too that we want our kids to make a difference in the world, to be bystanders, I mean, to be players and not bystanders. So the ultimate value of education for global competence is that it develops a disposition in youth to take action for the common good and in ways that weigh the positive and negative consequences for actions for themselves and for others and for the planet. So we put together this webcast and the excellent panel of participants um, because we want you to have a deeper understanding of why educating youth, as they say in Singapore, to be globally minded but locally rooted is so important and why developing a global mindset and, 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 a, and a sense that they can be actors um, against racism and xenophobia and the other ways that we are so divided along racial, ethnic, and religious lines these days. So to take us forward, I'm very pleased to turn the proceedings back over to Dr. Neelam Chidauri, Executive Director of Global Learning at Asia Society. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion on raising global citizens. As Tony said, I'm Neelam Chowdhury, Executive Director of Global Learning Programs at Asia Society. We have a great lineup for you today, so I will get right to introductions. First, we have Shanita Gutierrez. Shanita has been dedicated to international education going back to when she was a teenager, when she founded a nonprofit program for marginalized youth in Panama City, Panama. She has taught in six countries throughout the, her career as a classroom teacher and language specialist. Her devotion to learning has led her to Pine Street School, a language immersion and international baccalaureate school based in downtown Manhattan where she's also the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator. Welcome, Shanita. Jennifer, Jennifer D. Klein has taught college and high school English and Spanish for 19 years, including five years in Central America. As a former head of school with extensive international experience, Jennifer is also committed to intersecting global project learning. And uh, with culturally responsive practices, she is the founder of Principal Learning Strategies and the author of the Global Education Guidebook. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. Kathleen Wong is a lead founder of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School in Western Massachusetts. Her school is a K-12 public charter school with a diverse student body from over 30 rural, suburban, and urban communities. All students are required to take Chinese and the high school is an international baccalaureate diploma program. This is Kathleen's 14th year as principal and she has almost 20 years of experience in education. Thanks for being here with us, Kathleen. And finally, our moderator for this evening is Homa Tavangar. Homa has been in the field for over three decades. Her work has addressed themes of culture, innovation, leadership, and global citizenship. Homa is the author of the best-selling book, Growing Up Global, Raising Children to Be at Home in the World. 
which was the inspiration behind NBC Universal's animated series, Nina's World, starring Rita Moreno. Her other books and publications include Global Kids, the Global Education Toolkit for Elementary Learners, and her 2021 release, Nine Big Questions Schools Must Answer to Avoid Going Back to Normal, because normal wasn't that great to begin with. Homa has lived on four continents, has heritage in four world religions, and speaks almost four languages. Welcome, Homa. We are so pleased to have all of you here today to speak to this very important topic. For our audience, we will be taking questions later in the program, so please be sure to send them through the comments, either on Facebook or Twitter. Homa, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neelam. Uh, that was a really generous introduction, and it was great to hear from Tony Jackson uh, to kick us off. And it's great to join the Asia Society. Um, I really feel over more than a decade, you've all been really wonderful friends uh, to me and to my work. And kind of to kick us off with the topic of this panel, this idea of friendship. Those All of us on this panel have just known each other for a short time, but we already share so much. And I do feel like this is going to be a conversation among friends. And um, I frame it in this way because I think of this topic of global citizenship. Ultimately, for me, a global citizen has this disposition like a friend to the whole human race. And so for me, this is so special to be among friends like this. And so we wanna kick off our conversation um, with the basic, really important question uh, for each of you. What does global citizenship mean to you and why does it matter? So how about we kick it off with Shanita, please. Thank you so much, Homa. And I just wanna say a quick thank you to um, Neelam for having me here. For inviting me to be a part of tonight's conversation. Um, so to me, I think really what comes up to me as be being a glo global citizen is more attributes, like what makes up a global citizen. Um, it's someone who's open-minded, courageous, curious, who wants to make a change. Um, and they have all of these things have a foundation in respect and kindness. And it's a genuine respect, right? And a very caring appreciation for people and who they are um, from wherever, wherever they're from. Um, and I think it matters to me because the more people who are like this in the world, the better and cleaner and safer and more unified place the world can be. So I don't know if that's... Thank you. That's yeah. wonderful. Thanks. How about you, Kathleen? What does global citizenship mean to you and why does it matter? Um, yeah, I want to echo the thanks to all the all the Asia Society people and also my panelists as well. Um, what global citizenship means to me is both personal um, in that I am the daughter of immigrants. Um, so grew up with another culture and then they, of course, as immigrants uh, learned American culture. They were originally from China. So there's the personal side. From the sort of professional side, um, as an adult, I'm surrounded by K through 12 students and I love them. Um, I actually asked them their perspective on this particular question. I said, what does it mean? Um, I didn't ask every single 500 and some uh, student, but what one of them said to me, I just wanna share is, it means being kind to everyone you meet, no matter who they are. Um, and I, as an adult, feel that that is a very basic definition that many cultures share in their belief system or their value system. Implementing it is not always the, you know, implementation is the details, but I think to me, that's what it means to be a global citizen. It's kindness to anyone um, and how you, how you teach that in the students, how you as an adult practice that um, you know, I know from my personal family experience, it was a, it was a daily experience, um, much like my panelists who've lived in other countries or been around, you know, uh, global citizens and things like that. I think that's an important part of the definition. It's, it's sort of stepping out of your comfort zone as well and seeing other people um, with kindness and compassion. 
So. Thank you, Kathleen. I see a, I see a, a theme starting to emerge here. So Jennifer, how would you, uh, what does global citizenship mean to you and why does it matter? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of early experiential ed, right? So I was doing global ed when I was five, uh, before there was anything even close to the internet <laughs> in existence. Um, but I still remember when I first discovered um, this idea of systems theory. Um, and I think I was in college at the time. Um, and for me, actually, the word citizenship is a little bit problematic. And it always has been for me because I see it as a very Western concept um, that has a lot to do with civilized the world as well, which I have issues with, obviously. I think it's, unfortunately, the word itself is connected to colonialism. So I, I, um, I want to ground my response in, in more Eastern thought, right? Because I discovered systems theory at the same time that I discovered Buddhism, which became very much the path that I walked um, and, and continue to walk. Um, that idea of, of how it's not just interconnection, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a complete and total independent interdependence. And when we can see the world that way, when we can start to recognize that the problems that we're facing are absolutely universal, um, that something like racism that that, that, for example, is often described as a U.S. problem is actually at the heart of many of the conflicts all over the world, even if it was socioeconomically based or whatever you want to call it, or religion based, that race is still a part of it. I, I mean, I think as, as we can stop doing, oh, that's your problem, not mine, and start to see that your problem affects me and my issues affect you and we can work together towards something better, um, then, then we create something much better, right? Um, and, and all those borderless challenges that systems theory tells us, we can't just solve it in one place and nowhere else. Really being a global citizen from my perspective is understanding that and understanding that we're part of a much broader fabric. Oh, this is great. Um, you know, I, I think it's really fascinating. Each of you have given quite distinct uh, responses to what it what global citizenship means and what it means to you in particular. Um, but but I find you know there is such an interesting thread that is really about sort of the opposite of othering and the that this there is an intimacy to it when you like when Shanita is talking about different virtues and and qualities and Kathy from your own experience as a child of immigrants and and then you ended up talking about kindness as well and Jennifer you know having these ideas instilled from a very early age and then looking systemically um, but but ultimately it is so intimate and personal down to your personal beliefs. Um, I think that is such a fascinating, and, and I could not agree more. And, and this idea that I mentioned earlier of being a friend to the whole human race, that is also so deeply personal and intimate. And I think, you know, one of the sort of challenges, the, the sort of bad name that <clears throat> sort of globalism, you know, kind of gets is it is so othered, it is so out there, so over there. So, you know, let's think about, you know, it isn't, it doesn't feel personal and local and intimate. And, and what I'm hearing from each of you is if that's what it seems like, we're sort of missing the point. Um, and so we really wanna drill down to think about what can we do? What, what are some thoughts for parents at home? And so, you know, all of us working with educators or as educators ourselves know that that link between home and school, the messages that a child is getting at home, if those contradict the messages at school, there is a problem. That's a broken link. Um, so, you know, there is this really kind of fundamental question. Um, and maybe I will start with Kathy and then go to Jennifer and then to Shanita. Um, about families, the role of families. So how do you think families and communities can foster global citizenship in our children, in our youth? Um, and, you know, as an extension to that question, what do you wish parents would do? And what do you wish parents would not do? Uh, so it, it's, it's kind of three questions. So take what you want. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, it's a great question. Um, I don't think I have all the answers. I mean, this is worthy of a lifetime of uh, uh, research. 
Um, so the first question about what could parents do, I think there's many little things they could do. You know, I don't think this is the type of thing where, you know, there's a one big solution, we're gonna go do this and it's all gonna be fixed type thing. I think our actions are cumulative over a lifetime. Um, as a parent, certainly um, being able to, I like to start with your own family. Um, many families have a rich cultural heritage. Um, they may not always be aware of that, but they really do. Like seek out, if, if the grandparents or the elders or relatives may be alive, start collecting some family stories first, right? Um, and I think for children, if they can connect with their family members or if there is no family member, maybe there's somebody in the community or um, the church or some like even like teachers as well, connect with an adult that has um, a background that may not be familiar to you or you're just curious and, and want to get to know that person because I think the step towards sort of global citizen or global awareness starts in your own home community. Um, certainly where we are, I'm in Massachusetts, where we are, you know, I know a community that may be more rural is very different than a community that's urban, right? So you can start, it's very accessible to start in your community, um, branch out from there, you know, start with your family, then your community, and then branch out from there. And I think it's also one of the things where set your goals to be achievable, right? I, I think sometimes parents want to say, um, you know, I'm going to do this all in six months, or I'm going to do this all by the time they're 12 years old, right? It's a continuum of a lot of little things. Um, I also think one of the key things for parents is to to teach the kids to be curious because the kids themselves have a lot of questions. We as adults should not think that there's an answer that they have to seek out and this is it. I think it's our job to say, explore out of your comfort zone, right? Explore, your, you know, maybe even just explore a town that may be 20 miles away, right? right? Get involved in uh, community service projects when you're old enough, right? Like teenagers, get involved in your community. Get involved in um, groups that maybe you never thought you could get involved with, but take a, take a little bit of a, a calculated risk um, and get to know the people because this country has a very rich heritage of people from many different backgrounds. Um, and, and as Jennifer mentioned, you know, racism, well, there's there's that, there's class differences, there's language differences, there's, you know, things like that. If we can teach the children that um, in a safe way, branch out and meet people that are, are not just in your, your comfort zone. I think that's one, one piece. Um, and so that's, that's sort of my approach to it is, you know, you start with baby steps, but you also realize that this is a continuum of learning. And that when the, when the, when your parenting is done, when you have a young adult, the hope is that they have the skills to go continue this work into their own adulthood, so. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's wonderful, Kathleen. Uh, Jennifer. You know, I'm thinking now like a former English teacher. <laughs> um, you know, my answer probably would have been different before COVID hit, you know, and I hope that someday we can go back to one of the answers, which is travel with your kids, get them outside of their of their bubble, of their comfort zone, get them into new places, um, make sure that they're challenged by real life in other parts of the world, right? Um, and that they have opportunities not just to see the world through the, the window of the tour bus, but that they really that they do homestays, that they live in communities, that they talk to local leaders, um, you know, the, so that they learn to honor um, all of these different perspectives. But as an English teacher, too, I mean, I think there's so much that we can do through books, especially in early childhood. There's so much that we can do through, through really thoughtful choices that build empathy, that build that ability to listen to a story very different than our own, um, to honor the experience that's very different from our own. Um, and I, I 
I, you know, in my in my home, I, I was raised by um, by Jews, and so my Jewish upbringing was very very clearly like you can't be okay if your neighbor's not okay. It was a central central value. You have to step forward and do something if you know that your neighbor's not okay. So I think you know sometimes we find it in our faith paths in our homes. Sometimes we find it in a different way, but finding ways to really build that deep empathy and and to give them ways to do something with it too, right? Giving our kids ways, whether that's a service project or, you know, something as simple as a letter to the nurses in my community or my teachers or whoever it might be right now. Um, those small acts of kindness, I agree very much with Kathy. It doesn't have to be massive. We're going to travel around the world for six months for kids to, to cultivate it. And I know that um, for me, uh, children's literature is often, a re I mean, for me, a lot of my understanding of the world came to me through extraordinary children's books um, that weren't just the American story over and over. Mm, that's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That seems like a really good segue for Shanita. And But I will just repeat the question, how can families foster global citizenship in youth? And what do you wish parents would do or not do? So I love that um, Jennifer and Kathy, I feel like you kind of set me up for like a really good, to be able to like speak to all your points. Um, I think the first thing is yes, what we've all said, it starts at home, it's with the family, you know, what we're doing um, all together at home. I loved what you said, Kathy, though, about it being a continuum, because it is, there's no like check off list or like, oh, we did this, so we're global citizens now, yay. No, it's like a constant thing that you do, that you grow um, with. Um, and then Jennifer, what you were saying about literature and like, I was clapping because it's exactly, yes. I think it was Kathleen Woodson, um, J sorry, Jacqueline Woodson that had said, sometimes children, you know, if you're limited in, you know, even now like COVID, think of COVID, we can't go, we can't travel, but books are the way that children can explore the world. They can get to know different cultures. And like Jennifer, you said, um, building empathy, you know, storytelling too. And Kathy, you mentioned that as well. I think I growing up and my grandmother's stories were like, they, they were pivotal in my life. I could go back and reference them and go, Ooh, or think of like, how am I going to, um, act or be in a situation based on what my grandmother had told me or the stories that my mom had told me. So all of these lessons that were learned through all of this storytelling, um, at Pine Street, um, Eileen Baker, our head of school, she works with us when we're developing units and we do something, she's said something called concentric circles. So it's always starting with the child, right? So whether they're two or, or 10, it's always starting with them because that's the easiest point of reference. I know me first and then I can know everyone else after, right? And I can make parallels, I can make connections. And I think that's super important too, to keep in mind, you know, in this building, you know, a global citizen at home. Um, and then I think the, in the, what would I do or what would I suggest? There are a couple things, I think modeling, being that global citizen that you want to see your child be in a sense or letting them see that you are a global citizen kind of i want to say but like letting them see your curiosity letting them see what you enjoy what you love you know modeling that curiosity and that interest in the world i'm um, asking open-ended questions I love my families and my parents, and, and if any of them are here tonight, hello, I love you. But I feel like sometimes parents feel the need to ask like very specific hard ball questions. You know, let's leave those for like, you know, politicians, you know, ask your kids, how was lunch? You know, what happened at, because it's the social and that's always a really good opener. Oh yeah, so we did this or we had, you know, peas. Oh, I hate peas. And it builds a conversation and it gets it going. Um, ask why too. That's another really great. And sometimes they'll say like, I don't know. And don't be afraid to not know. Yeah. Don't be afraid to kind of like, oh, I have no idea or let's look into that together and, and explore things as a family. Thank you. Well, those are great. It, and it really makes me think about also just my own experience as a parent. Um, and this is something I, I wrote about this a lot in Growing Up Global, but the idea that, you know, when I made global citizenship sort of a project for my kids, you know, they could smell it from a mile away and they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but when it just 
was part of my own modeling, my own curiosity, like you talk about Shanita, my own exploration, um, following my own curiosity and interests, and then sharing that with my kids. And just, this can be so authentic. And so many times parents, our interaction with our kids is so much about what we need to do, things we need to get done. It feels naggy a lot of time. You know, you may be the bad cop if you're listening to this. Um, you know, if there's a good cop, bad cop in the equation. Um, and um, the beauty of, I think, exploring the world through the lens of a global citizen, it really is like this exploration. And especially now with COVID, with not being able to travel, of course, the favorite thing, the best thing is to travel the world with our kids. We can't do that, so what can we do? And so, you know, all the ways that we can explore from home, you know, simple things like recipes and food and even takeout from places we'd never been before, grocery stores that, you know, like to Kathy's point about, you know, what's within 10 or 20 mile radius of where you live, there is very likely an ethnic grocery store within a 20 to 50 mile radius of where everybody on this call lives. And um, that's sort of the beautiful story of if you're in the United States, um, you know, so, you know, and it, it isn't just on the coasts, it's everywhere. Um, and, and another thing is like a lot of people are watching a lot of TV and movies and streaming these days. There is so much good content on the streaming channels um, for children around the from around the world. And like even that, like maybe I'm tired of reading a book, but you know, there is there are so many options just to get started with, you know, little by little, day by day, the small steps that we can take can be really powerful. Yeah, Kathy. I was gonna say one thing that um I like also doing, and again, being around students ranging from five years old and up is language learning. Um, and Jennifer, you're a former English teacher. Sunita, you're there. If you can't travel or go five, 10 miles away or whatever, when kids learn language, you know, the, the English language, I wish every kid would learn another language other than, you know, their home language. I, I think being multilingual is a beautiful way to to expose kids to other uh, obviously other cultures and languages but even in the english language if that's your home language okay whatever your home language is so many words enter into language that have origin from other places and as children read books or they encounter phrases or they, they, they see a word that they just giggle over because it just sounds interesting or, or things like that. You know, if a parent can afford a dictionary, just a simple dictionary, it has the roots and the origin of the words. And that can be a simple sort of way to start a dialogue with a child. And it doesn't even matter their age because you could make it a game, you could pick a word of the day or a word of the week, or let the kid look at that dictionary. I used to love reading different dictionaries, believe it or not. Now people do things online. Um, you know, when we see young children building those early literacy skills, sometimes they really do giggle when they see a word that just seems so odd. Like, why is it pronounced that way? Like, English has a lot of inconsistencies. It's not a pure phonetic language because it has the richness of words that come from other places, yeah. right? Um, like even Massachusetts, the word Massachusetts, that's a Native American word, right? And so it can be a bridge to teach kids naturally about things that, like I always wanna make sure there's something as accessible for families so they don't necessarily have to, you know, jet off to some, you know, exotic place and that's right. know, whatever. And but that's part of the equity issue as well. Totally, totally. Yeah. And then again, if you don't speak another language, don't beat yourself up about that. Talk about, you know, whatever your home language is, because just about every language on this planet has adopted some root words from their own heritage, but also through history, languages evolved to have, um, you know, words that come from other places. And a common dictionary, even the littlest ones, 
um, will have the roots of the words and that can start a dialogue with the kids. So, I, And I love that as also um, it, language learning as an as a sort of embodiment and an entry point to deeper empathy as well. And all of you have discussed the theme of empathy and how integral that is to global citizenship. And probably every parent wants their child to grow up as happy and empathetic. Um, so that is another way. And I think definitely with all the technology, uh, you could have a tutor who lives on the other side of the world, who's a native speaker uh, that you, learn through video. There are so many applications that you can download and learn and, and so many ways. So um, yeah, that's fantastic. So I want to ask one question and I want to do it sort of as a lightning round. Okay. So just like if you have one quick piece of advice. Um, so this is, has to do with what might a healthy school family, community, partnerships. So all of you as educators, what would you love, what, what is sort of the thing you would love to see or what does it look like to have a healthy partnership, particularly when it comes to equity at the heart of your MO as a school and building global citizenship. So what might be like, one key idea of a partnership, um, Jennifer, if you could start that. Sure, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> um, I know, it's a big question, sorry. It's a big question, no, it's okay. And I just spent three plus years as a head of school, right? So for me, it's a very, it, there, there are lots of layers to this, but mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is that parents and schools can be working together um, in tandem as opposed to in opposition. That was something that I remember seeing, unfortunately, more of than I wanted to. Um, and over the years, I've, I've seen plenty of um, really great relationships develop as well. Um, but what, for example, if uh, there was a school that I was working with at one point who had that had a, they were reading a, a long walk to water. And there was a mother from Kenya originally whose initial reaction to that work was anger. And she sent, spent a very angry email to the teachers about their choice of that book because she said, not everybody who walks for water has a miserable experience. It's a, it's a community activity for women and girls. And, and it's not always um, as it's often painted. Um, and the only thing that I wish had happened differently is that she had just written to them and said, I would love to come in and offer this other perspective because what I got as their coach was two panic teachers going, oh my gosh, what we do, what do we do? And I said, well, what a great problem to have, invite her in have her come in and tell this, her story. But it could have been a much smoother partnership and a healthier partnership if she had just stepped up and said, you know what, there's more to this story and I would love to share it with your kids. Um, so I think that's the, 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 the heart of a healthy relationship. Thank you, that's great. Thanks, Shanita. Um, I think for me, just as a teacher is trust, making sure that parents and, um, administration and school and teachers as well we have a relationship that's based in trust like you've picked us you know we're gonna do our best and we want you to be involved you know asking questions you know really I, I you know exactly what Jennifer was saying like inviting and having like a, a reciprocal re relationship right where parents are like feel welcome and and teachers as well feel open and welcome to invite and to ask you. And it, yeah, um, I think that's it, yeah. Yeah, trust. Trust. When, when trust underlies the relationship, there's yeah. so much that can be done. Exactly. Yeah, Kathy. I think it's respectful connection, um, which, fee, which, which builds on trust and it builds on um, that harmony that Jennifer talked about. Um, Respect to me is fundamental in a relationship. Um, it's, it's not just formality of respect. It's how we communicate, how we behave, how open we are to another person's view. Um, the connected piece to me is that you have to have in a school family relationship the connection really is essential because 
this, the children are watching our connection as adults. We want the children to connect to the educators and the teachers, because if a child feels connected, then they will learn in a very safe, if they feel safe, emotionally safe, and then the academics can come, right? So the social emotional piece of connectedness and belonging in your school environment um, is I think absolutely essential. And if they don't feel that connectedness, how do we, how do we outreach to them? Um, and how do we build that connectedness? Um, I think for parents, and I'm a parent myself, I have teenagers, parenting is a journey that also is a lifetime piece. And the schools that we choose to send our kids to, or if we're homeschooling, we as parents also need the, that feeling that we're connected to other adults who are going through this process to educate the next generation. So to me, it's respectful connection. That's great. So, so I'm hearing, you know, things about sort of open communication, trust, respectful, commun respectful connection. Um, and it is, it is interesting because it's, it almost is like those are also answers of what does it mean to be a global citizen and how do you you know demonstrate that and so those lessons of global citizenship really are so applicable to so many elements of life um partnership friendship authentic connection communication and i guess it kind of leads us to uh kind of our final overarching question um, it wouldn't be an Asia Society program if we did not refer to the fantastic model of the four domains of global competence. And I have to say that this model, these four domains, and they have been communicated in different formats graphically, um, but it is a very, it, it is a deceptively simple and elegant model to help build global competence in the classroom. And what our sort of challenge extension tonight is to think about how families can also try to live those four domains and integrate them not only in a narrow, not that global competence is ever narrow, but not only global competence, but really, you know, kind of based on the opening language that Tony Jackson shared, um, he talked about the unrelenting commitment to equity. And I loved that. So how can this help us realize at home, not only in a global lesson at school, an unrelenting commitment to equity? And I'm just gonna walk through really quick what these four domains are um, in the order that we're gonna talk about them. So. The, the process of um, global competence kicks off with investigating the world. And that means students investigate the world beyond their immediate environment. I also often think of it as um, when you're researching, you know, get beyond the first page of Google, go beyond the textbook, go beyond sort of the usual suspects of where you look for information, widen your aperture, of the possible information, the voices that you are drawing from, um, and you know, kind of let that be your guide. So the next um, domain is to recognize perspectives. So it is, this is the deep empathy where students recognize their own and others' perspectives. So you may never be the one who is carrying water a couple miles, but um, reading the stories, thinking about those individuals, considering through a lens of empathy what they may be going through is part of this process of at least attempting to recognize perspectives. And then communicate ideas. So that has to do with students communicate their ideas effectively with diverse audiences. And I, I think of that as using diverse technologies, you know, go beyond the poster and the worksheet and the exam to demonstrate your knowledge. How do you demonstrate that knowledge? And then take action. So this is the one that I think makes 
whatever you're learning unforgettable. You are experiencing it. You're translating ideas into actions to improve conditions, to make a difference um, out there in the world. So it's an amazing model for uh, teaching. It's an amazing model for the classroom, but let's also think about how we um, translate this. So Shanita, could you talk to the domain of investigating the world, please? So at Pine Street School, this is huge because we have a, our curriculum is based in using the city as a classroom. So we do get out there. We encourage our kids to explore, you know, looking at different places just in downtown Manhattan. It's absolutely amazing just to all the history that's down there. But looking at the family, um, investi investigating the world within your neighborhood, you know, or even your house, your block. You know, if you live in New York City or wherever in, in the world, you know, there's so much history in just where we are and encouraging that. I think the main thing um, is to let your children lead you. What are Look at what their interests are. Look at how they play, what they play with, what are their interests. Um, explore those with them and have them, like I had said before, um, see you and see what you're interested in and explore the world together. Um, and just really encouraging that natural curiosity and fostering that and making your home an environment for learning and for exploration, making them feel safe to ask questions and to wonder and to, you know, make noticings and to ask all those difficult questions. Um, and then, yeah, like explore your neighborhood, go to all the different, you know, restaurants, like all the things that we've talked about already, different food, yeah. takeout, all that stuff. No. Yeah. And I want to say, Shanita, like it is amazing to be in Manhattan uh, to do that. And um, I spent my most of my childhood and adolescence in Fort Wayne, Indiana, not known as a cosmopolitan hotspot. And there are so many opportunities to do that also in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You do not have to be in Manhattan. And that's part of, you know, kind of what a special time we live in. Um, so, Kathy. Could you please speak to recognizing perspectives? I would love to. Um, and I'm not in Manhattan either. Uh, we're in Western Massachusetts. Um, I do love New York. So <laughs> um, for us, recognizing perspectives was a fundamental piece of the design of our school. We serve a, we're a public charter school and serve a region of service of 39 communities spanning um, rural communities. These are very small rural um, sort of New England towns where you, know, you might have a population of, you know, 500, 600 people. And it's very, there's more trees and, and wildlife than people. So very rural. Um, and some of those communities didn't have internet until, you know, very recently, you know, we're in this COVID thing. So we're, 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 we're seeing the inequities of, you know, rural communities. Not, and uh, we also support a suburban set of communities. Okay, and then we also support urban communities where we see um, uh, urban poverty or situations that you might see in uh, much larger cities. Um, so for us, by design, we wanted kids from all different um, backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, rural, urban, suburban, um, to come together in a school. Um, and they learn from each other that even though they may be from a neighboring town, those towns could be very different. And, and I think that, that to expose a child to that when they're younger, when they have less preconceived notions um, was a key part of our mission to have kids you know, learn about other perspectives. One of the key things I think is you not only look outside to your community or to out of your comfort zone, which I talked a little bit before, but we're also trying to teach kids some self-reflection um, to understand themselves because we know that you can only sort of control yourself and how you view the world, right? You know, a lot of people may try to control others or, um, you know, uh, 
do sort of the tourist thing and say, I'm going to visit this country and then therefore I understand this country or I understand this culture, right? That's sort of, um, I don't blame them for that, but it can be very hard to see sort of something authentic or deeper um, if you yourself are not sort of open to it. So I think you gain perspective of other people or other people's perspective. First, if you have the opportunity to meet people who are not in your sort of normal sphere of interaction or maybe a little different or similar than you. I, I actually think a lot of kids find out, it doesn't matter if you're from a rural or urban environment, you got a lot of similarities, right? I like very much when kids play together. You know, they're not caring where they're from, they're just playing together. And, you know, a six-year-old can play, you know, on the playground with another kid, but so can a 17-year-old. It's just, you know, and even an adult, you know, we socialize, you know, with our adult friends or whatever, and we have to also step out of our comfort zone, so to speak, sometimes, but that takes our own self-reflection to say that I am okay doing that, and I, I will do that. Um, so I really do think for parents um, and other people listening, don't forget about your own sort of self-care and your own self-reflection to understand your own perspective and be confident that you can have that inner strength to, you know, sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone is risky, but have that inner strength or build that up somehow so that you can step out of your comfort zone. Because a lot of times people don't feel comfortable and then they sort of get really worried about it or they get anxious or they, you know, they don't take that next step, but it's like, you got to do that also for yourself. So. Yeah. Thank you. It, it's almost for parents. I think it's like expanding our comfort zone and then that creates a wider comfort zone for our own kids too. Um, yeah. So the uh, third domain is communicating ideas. So I'll just take that really briefly. Um, you know, it, it's different, um, you know, what, what you would do in a school project for communicating ideas versus in the home environment. And it makes me think about there's um, something that I, I really urge parents and teachers to um, kind of flip the script with our kids is switch from asking our kids and you know all of us grew up being asked what do you want to be when you grow up and just thinking about what we how we talk to our kids that is that is a very uh sort of um final heavy high pressure uh high stakes question um and if we switch that if we switch some of our communication with our kids so from what do you want to be when you grow up to what problem do you want to solve? And so you begin this journey of not just being curious, but thinking about how you might be of service, how you might be useful. Um, what, what do I need to learn in order to be a problem solver to make a difference? It might be in terms of communicating ideas. It might mean I need to learn a particular language. It might mean, um, you know, lots of different ways to learn, to communicate, and kind of going back to, you know, the different sources of information, the different types of media that I would not only consume, but maybe also produce. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of flipping and switching. I'm, co I'm combining those words. <laughs> um, flipping and switching mindsets and expanding and adapting um, a lot of new, to me, they're very abundant mindsets. And I think as parents, we want our kids to have a more open, abundant, um, visionary, maybe, mindset. And um, sometimes it, you know, also in communicating ideas, it's also being really clear about what matters to your family. And so, you know, that these are, our values are global citizenship. Our values are um, caring about how people around the world are doing. Our values are, uh, we're going to take time to do service on a regular basis. Um, if you, you know, and, and if that matters to you, you're doing more than giving lip service to it. Um, so I think that domain in particular is pretty different for home 
and school, but, but it's something, you know, it's almost like you get practice thinking about it. Um, and then the final domain of taking action, Jennifer. So, yeah, I think you're right that this is where they all come together. And, and as a result, it's also the, the facet that ensures that kids don't feel hopeless when they're learning about things that are really hard to, you know, I remember the first time I learned about global conflict. If I had not had a way to go demonstrate against a, a South African apartheid, for example, or to go, you know, um, protest outside of the nuclear weapons plant here in, that existed when I was a teenager here in Colorado. If I hadn't found those channels for action on the things that I had come to understand about the world, whether it was local or global, um, I would have ended up a very angry adult. Um, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind. As kids are exposed to this, they have to find ways to take action. Um, but I think the equity piece is really important. And I dedicated a lot of time in the Global Education Guidebook to the question of equity, because I think it's very easy for us to fall into the trap of of thinking that service, for example, and I agree with you, Homa, I think it should be a central uh, facet of childhood. I think it's something that families should be doing together as a family. Um, but I also think that sometimes it gets misinterpreted in the home as much as it does in the schoolhouse, to be honest. Um, and it's seen as we're gonna go help people today. Um, I've seen too many projects, whether they're family or school, where there's a um, what I would actually describe as a sort of savior mentality or an old colonial idea about one group of people having the answer for another one, right? Um, and knowing better than another one. And, and true global citizens don't think that way. True global citizens enter a new context, whether that's, you know, and, and I want to clarify, global can mean Native American communities five minutes from you too, right? It doesn't have to be the other side of the world. Um, but that when we engage with others, when we, when we take on a service project, that we see ourselves as walking alongside them. And that means really starting from a place of they know how to solve their own problems. I'm just here to support them, right? I'm just here to be a part of this as opposed to I know what they need. This is what they need. And I'm just going to do it for them because they can't do it for themselves. That's a, a real deficit way of thinking about others. And the asset way of thinking about others is every community in the world um, has answers that other communities need <laughs> um, and learning with each other and, and working together and walking that path together is far more powerful and, and, and probably more healing in the long run for our planet than, you know, I think I, think I figured out the solutions and so now I'm going to save uh, this group of people. I'm so happy that you mentioned, I'm so grateful that you brought that up, Jennifer. It would have really, uh, this conversation would have really been lacking without that clarity um, that is so important. This is not about being anyone's savior, and it is not about, um, you know, filling the deficits of other places. It's really, we, we, there is so much that we all learn through the whole process. Absolutely. Well, and we have to remember, too, that service might mean we go clean up our local park, right? Service doesn't necessarily mean that we're helping to take care of somebody who can't take care of themselves, right? Like we really yeah. have to shift that mindset. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of comes, brings up a question that always comes up in these for about um, global versus local, uh, you know, and it kind of becomes this either or again, scarcity mindset. And it is very much of an and, a yes, and there is no problem. There is no dichotomy. Uh, I. I am local and I am global. And um, it, you know, that's part of the mindset that is very important. Parents can really help their children um, as they're learning it, they can help instill. Um, so that kind of takes us, we have just a few minutes. We'll take a qu another question um, from the audience. Um, and that is, it's a big one. It comes up all the time. How do you balance global education with content standards and district requirements, those must do uh, sort of structures of school. How do you balance that? And I'll just, whoever wants to raise their hand to answer, please go ahead, Jennifer. 
I'm glad to jump in because obviously running a school was all about <laughs> trying to make sure um, that we were in fact hitting the standards as well. I mean, I think there's often a perception among teachers, among parents, that global is something that we do separately. Um, and I think actually any discipline, any topic, any any topic that we're, we're working on in class can have that global element. I often think of it as being like an accordion. You know, we're going to look at this moment in history in this place, but then we're also going to understand its reverberations out out into broader communities and even back from the world to our own, right? Um, I, I, I totally understand the concern from parents and I think it's a, a very important thing to that we have to keep working on in the schoolhouse and the home as well. Um, but the I, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I guess that's ultimately my point. I think that we can take any set of standards and turn it into a meaningful experience for students that includes somewhere along the way um, that global voice. Um, and what I often uh, coach teachers around is this idea of, you know, see if you can find somebody who is experiencing what the kids are learning or see if you can find somebody, in other words, they're living it, right? Like they don't have access to water, right? Let's let's hear from somebody like that. Try to get a first um, and person. Let's hear, right, exactly, that primary source experience. Yeah. And let's hear from people who are working to solve it too, so that we can learn how experts are approaching that given uh, challenge, right? Um, and get ideas from them and come up with our own as well. Um, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And I think it's, it's easy to start to feel like they are if you think of global as something that's extra um, that yeah. happens on the periphery. Yeah, and hopefully this whole panel has shown it's not an it's not just extra. Uh, Shanita or Kathy, do you want to do you have anything to add? Yeah, Shanita. So, uh, for us at Pine Street, it's completely interwoven. So, all of what we do, whether it's in diversity, equity and inclusion or, you know, our our cultural um, units of inquiry, um, those standards are built in. Um that being said, there are times when we have to do something that's, you know, outside of that and we just focus on on what the children need, but it's always based on, again, concentric circles, what the child needs and hitting those standards as well. So, mm -hmm. but it's all, it's all working together in yeah. our planning and how we go about it and how we organize lessons. Yeah. And it sounds like there's such a coherence. Exactly. Kathy, a minute. You have the last minute. I was going to say, don't think you can't be part of the change. Um, before I was part of the founding group to start the school, I was part of a statewide initiative looking at international education and um, trying to get more integration. I think Jennifer talked about, don't think of it as something separate, but more integration of international content into the standards. Um, you have to be patient. It takes years to get standards changed, but it is possible to make those changes. So I, I think that's my parting thought. And of course you pick materials and you train your staff and you, you try, to, try to get kids exposed to a bunch of stuff. But I also think that standards, there are people who write standards. It's a whole piece yeah. that you know not everybody might be interested in, but it's not impossible to get standards changed and um, have more of that international global content written into the standards. So that's what my sort of piece of advice is. Mm -hmm. and, and parents can get involved too. You know, call your department of education or something like that. So let your districts know this is important to you. Let your schools know that you are paying attention and this really matters. Yes. So thank you. I am we our hour is up it flew by thanks to jennifer shanita kathy tony jackson neelam chowdhury um, this was a wonderful conversation we really appreciate it hi everybody thank you so much for a wonderful panel i really appreciate all of your time your expertise your experience um, there's a favorite quote of mine from the evening from jennifer if we have to, we have to find ways for children to take action or else they will become angry adults. I think that's just such a, an amazing way to look at it. And I love how you the examples that you gave. You want to give kids the opportunity to um, really explore what they're you know, struggling with and really explore the things that they are upset about and want to improve on and change. And I think that's the way you said it was just so perfect. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you all for your passion and dedication. 
Um, I think that a lot of parents on this panel probably learned a lot, not only about you know, what's happening with global education, but what it is that they can do at home for their own students and their own children. So thank you very much for that. And for our audience, please be sure to visit our website for more discussions that teach truth to power by visiting www.asiasociety.org slash education. Thanks again to everybody and have a great evening. Thank you.